You remember when candidate Donald J. Trump said? Because we're going to turn it around and we're going to start winning again. We're going to win so much. We're going to win at every level. We're going to win economically. We're going to win with the economy. We're going to win with military. We're going to win with health care and for our veterans. We're going to win with every single facet. We're going to win so much, you may even get tired of winning. Let's look at some of this winning, shall we? Check out a recent Gallup poll on happiness and on personal finances. Nine in 10 Americans are satisfied with the way things are going in their personal life, a new high in Gallup's four decade trend. The latest figure bests the previous high of 88% recorded in 2003. It is likely no coincidence that Americans' heightened satisfaction with their personal life comes as confidence in the U.S. economy and their personal finances are also at long-term or record highs." End of quote. Remember during the 2016 campaign, candidate Donald Trump said this? And I think more importantly than anything else, we are going to start winning again. This country is going to start winning again. We don't win anymore. We don't win with our military. We can't beat ISIS. We're going to knock the hell out of them. We don't win. We don't win a trade. China, everybody, Japan, Mexico, Vietnam, India, name the country. Anybody we deal, anybody we do business with beats us. We don't win a trade. We're going to win a trade. We're going to make our country rich again. We're going to make our country great again. Trump is winning. Start with the military. In the budget, uh, we took care of the military like it's never been taken care of before. In fact, General Mattis called me, he goes, wow, I can't believe I got everything we wanted. I said, that's right, but we want no excuses. We want, we want you to buy twice, okay? Twice what you thought for half the price. Our military was totally depleted and we will have a military like we've never had before. Even Mike Bloomberg says the military has never been stronger. Mike Bloomberg. Things that I've seen recently convince me that the military today is better prepared than they've been in an awful long time and that the monies they are spending on the war weapons we need for the next war and not Thank for the last, a common mistake that they're not making now. They're Thank doing you. a good job. And Trump promised to crush ISIS. Trump said during the campaign he would give the military 30 days to deliver recommendations for defeating ISIS. Well? And as his first year in office closes out, there's extremely positive evidence we may be getting closer than ever. ISIS has lost now 98% of its territory in Iraq and Syria, according to Ryan Dillon. He's the chief spokesman for Operation Inherent Resolve. These villages were won back from ISIS, building by building. We eventually arrive at a staging point for refugees, a bleak, wind-blasted plain where IS survivors emerge from the ruins of their caliphate. There's so many of them, no one expected an exodus on this scale. Over three days, 10,000 women and children come out of the dust from Baguz, the final holdout of ISIS. In truth, the ragtag remains of the Islamic State has little fight left in it here. Its operatives have been bombed and starved for weeks now and cornered in this kill zone. They have nowhere to run. On trade with China. For months, I've been skeptical about the trade negotiations, even though we clearly had the upper hand. I figured the U.S. and China were too far apart on these issues, so both sides would try to hold out until something changed the equation. Then today we learned that Trump administration has reached a preliminary deal with the Chinese that takes next week as planned tariff hikes off the table. So how the heck did that happen? If you take and take and take, once you simply stop taking, it's a big deal. I think that's been Trump's strategy all along. In the last few months, he's added multiple schedules of tariffs that were set to go higher automatically. He made these ever-increasing import duties the new normal. He's also placed restrictions on visas for anyone connected with China's human rights abuses. He stopped key components from going to one of the world's largest telco companies, crushing the leadership in 5G wireless. 
What else? Trump's put on onerous sanctions on Costco, COSCO, the largest shipping company. Very important. After years of expansion blessing by, uh, blessed by other presidents, Trump is encouraging American companies to stop building new factories there, and it's working. His tariffs have forced our businesses to change their supply chains. They've basically had to cut China out of the picture as fast as possible or face ruinous tariffs. Last but not least, he's hinted at the possibility of capital constraints, making it harder for Chinese companies to raise money here in the U.S. Now our efforts have yielded a transformative deal that will bring tremendous benefits to both countries. We have a great relationship with China. We have a great relationship with the leadership of China. And China fully understands that there has to be a certain reciprocity. There has to be. It cannot continue like this. It would be dangerous for it to continue like it was. The agreement we signed today includes groundbreaking provisions in an area of critical importance to the United States, protecting intellectual property. I keep wondering uh, when people are going to recognize that it is historic that tariffs did succeed. They weren't supposed to work. The Chinese were supposed to be able to get around them. It didn't happen. Uh, the Chinese were uh, kind of accepting that they had to do something in order to keep the American market. On trade with Mexico and with Canada. And I want to thank everybody for coming, coming to the White House on this very momentous, historic, and joyous occasion. It's been a long time. Everybody said this was a deal that could not be done. Too complicated, too big, couldn't be done. We got it done. And today, we're finally ending the NAFTA nightmare and signing into law the brand new U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement. Very special. On the economy. There's a fellow by him, Michael Semblis. I don't know if you know him, but he is the uh, chairman of market and investment strategy at JP, JP Morgan. He came up with a list of what the cable companies, cable, CNN, MSM, what do they cover? S the number 16th, 16th is positive economic news. Mm -hmm. All the rest of them are negative. So you know what's going on here, Joe. People don't want to say good things. And this is the best number I've ever seen in my life. On immigration. That document does create two changes that immigrants will see. One of them saying that if anyone jumps over the wall, whether or not they are seeking asylum, they will be deported back to Mexico. No more jumping the line. That's the message from the Department of Homeland Security. Before this change, anyone illegally entering the U.S. claiming asylum would be detained and possibly cutting hundreds waiting in Mexico. DHS's statement says the southern border is in an urgent humanitarian and security crisis, explaining the migrant protection protocol is going into effect due to the high volume of asylum claims with no merit and stating many have disappeared in the U.S. while waiting for a ruling. And that is a big game changer. Huge. The second big concern, asylum seekers staying in Mexico throughout their case. Regardless of the outcome of the credible fear, you go back to Mexico and you wait until you're hearing on the merits. Our focused efforts to address the flow of illegal immigration from the Northern Triangle countries has been incredibly successful. The acting commissioner of Customs and Border Production says the number of people arriving at the U.S. border has dropped for eight straight months. What we experienced in January, 36,679 illegal immigrants were encountered on our southwest border. That's 75% lower than the peak of May, and that's 37% lower than this time last year. On fighting sanctuary cities and sanctuary states. Number four, block funding for sanctuary cities. We block the funding, no more funding. We will end the sanctuary cities that have resulted in so many needless deaths. Cities that refuse to cooperate with federal authorities will not receive taxpayer dollars, and we will work with Congress to pass legislation to protect those jurisdictions that do assist federal authorities. Then Attorney General Sessions made it a top priority and used a then recent case to illustrate the seriousness of the problem. Just two months ago, an alleged illegal alien, Sergio Martinez, was arrested in Portland. Martinez was unlawfully in the United States, had been deported at least 20 times, and police reports show that he was arrested at least 10 times this year, accused of everything from possessing drugs to stealing a car. Federal immigration authorities 
had properly lodged a detainer against Martinez just a few months before asking to be notified when he was set to be released. A simple request. But authorities in Oregon refused. According to the allegations, Martinez then broke into the home of a 65-year-old Portland woman by crawling through her bedroom window. Once inside, he reportedly forced her to the ground, used scarves and socks to blindfold, bind, and gang, uh, gag her, and then raped her and slammed her head into the wooden floor. These policies, they do greater damage than many people understand. At its root, it's a rejection of our nation's immigration laws that many of you work so hard to enforce. Of course, lawsuits went to flying, but the Trump administration recently received an appellate victory. A federal appeals court in New York ruled Wednesday that the Justice Department can withhold federal funds from so-called sanctuary jurisdictions. In 2017, the DOJ announced it would withhold millions of dollars in policing grants from states and cities that refused to cooperate with federal immigration authorities. To receive the grant money, states would have to share certain information about undocumented immigrants with federal authorities upon request. New York City, the state of New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, Washington, Massachusetts, Virginia, and Rhode Island all sued. The most recent ruling overturns two lower court decisions that blocked the DOJ from setting these requirements for the grants. Trump promised to end catch and release. We are going to end catch and release. We catch them, oh, go ahead. We catch them, go ahead. Under my administration, anyone who illegally crosses the border will be detained until they are removed out of our country and back to the country from which they came. Promise made. Late Friday, President Trump signed a memo ordering the end of a policy known as catch and release. Under that policy, undocumented immigrants are released from detention while awaiting a court hearing on their status. In a statement, the White House said in part, quote, the safety and security of the American people is the president's highest priority, and he will keep his promise to protect our country and to ensure that our laws are respected. Promise kept. Oh, and on building the Southern Wall and who picks up the check? Number one, are you ready? Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. We will build a great wall along the Southern border. Well, according to a December 2019 article in Newsweek with the following headline, Trump has built nearly 100 miles of border wall by the end of 2019 with 350 miles to go in 2020. In a border wall status report provided to Newsweek, 98 miles have been constructed in places of dilapidated and outdated designs. Customs and Border Patrol has said that construction on brand new barriers is currently underway. However, crews will still need to see a total of 352 miles built before the end of 2020 if Trump wants to make good on his long held promise, end of quote. Okay, so it's an incomplete, but not for lack of trying. As far as Democrats who are criticizing Trump for having allegedly built no new border wall, I thought they didn't want him to. Now, the other part, of course, was that Mexico was going to pay for it. And Mexico will pay for the wall. Hundred percent. Oh, there have been some interesting ideas as to how to finance the wall. Hey, Senator Cruz. What do you think about El Chapo being sentenced to life today? Uh, I think it's great that he's sentenced. I think the next step is to criminally forfeit his entire global criminal enterprise. It's worth billions, and we should use every penny of that money to build the wall and secure the border. That's why I introduced legislation, the El Chapo Act, to use that money to build the wall. 
People from all across the nation are donating money right now to the group We Build the Wall. The group is hosting a major fundraiser called a Wallathon in Summon Park. And if you support a wall, and I do, does it really matter who pays? Or as this former Secretary of State once put it, what difference at this point does it make? <laughs> Copy that, Madam Secretary. So are we tired yet of winning? I don't feel no ways tired. Well, I don't think most of America is no ways tired of winning either. I'm Larry Elder, and we've got a country to say. I'll see you next time.